Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, a subspecies of the familiar Canada goose, known as the dusky Canada goose, which nests in coastal Alaska, might be in jeopardy today because of an earthquake which occurred over a decade ago. Efforts are now being made to preserve this fine bird. We were invited by the U.S. Forest Service to observe their research project currently underway. And so, Dick Denny flew to Alaska. The earthquake caused an unusual condition which permitted coyotes and other predators to reach the nesting geese. The dusky Canada geese nest in the marshy land which forms Alaska's Copper River Delta at the river's end just as it reaches the sea. The earthquake caused this land to rise several feet and much of the water drained away, allowing predators to cross some of the dried up tidal marshes. And so a banding program was initiated to determine if any serious reduction was occurring in the goose population. The project took place just over a hundred miles from Anchorage, here along Alaska's southern coast. The results of the project could provide the United States Forest Service with the knowledge it needs to preserve the dusky Canada geese nesting in the land at River's End. A light, maneuverable, pontoon-equipped plane is the familiar mode of travel used to reach this magnificent region. Great glaciers inch their way seaward, filling streams with icy water as they melt in early summer. This particular glacier is on a tributary stream about 15 miles from the Copper River Delta which is our ultimate destination. The research project here is under the leadership of Peter Mickelson, U.S. Forest Service, project biologist of Chukach National Forest. His responsibility includes the delta we'll be visiting later. Peter has planned for us to land on a small lake in this area so we can observe the activities of the largest predator here, an animal the scientists watch closely to determine if it is harmful or even potentially harmful to the dusky Canada geese. Black bears are one of three bear species found here. We may not see any grizzlies, but brown bears are plentiful. plane will wait for us here while Peter and I head for a brushy area where we can conceal ourselves to watch the big predator. It's the Alaskan brown bear, which ranks with the polar bear as the world's largest carnivorous land animal. This clump of brush has served the researchers well as a blind before, so we'll use it now. Regular observations of the bears here is one of the many facets of Peter Mickelson's conservation project. This area attracts the big Alaskan brown bears because the salmon are moving upstream to spawn and the bears have come to catch them. This isn't too good a place for the bear to fish. Deep, swift water here gives the salmon the advantage. It's in calmer water like this where the humpback salmon congregate and rest. In such areas, the brown bears have greater success fishing. However, it's not unusual for them to lose what they catch if they're not careful. <laughs> Part of the research here involves the tagging of bears and this one was previously ear-tagged for study. 
Thus far, the studies indicate that bears don't prey on geese at the Delta. Perhaps because they're so busy preying on the salmon so abundant in the river here, at the same time that the geese are raising their families. Evidently, only one ear tag bear is here today. We've logged that, so now we'll leave here. It's only a matter of another five or 10 minutes to the Copper River Delta, where a camp has been set up for the goose banding project, which is underway. This is such vast country, it hardly seems possible anything could disrupt it. Yet, the environment here may change as coal and petroleum interests come to explore and search for minerals. If that occurs, then it is important to take steps now to preserve the wildlife here which may be affected. Our pilot, Al Springer has charted his route so that we follow the Copper River Valley directly to the Delta, which some scientists believe may have rich coal or oil resources beneath it. This is the only nesting area of the dusky Canada geese, and if the habitat changes drastically, the subspecies might suddenly be in danger. We've come directly over the temporary camp of some youngsters of the Youth Conservation Corps. They've come here to aid in the Dusky Canada Goose Research Project. We'll land fairly close to their camp and join them at the area where the goose banding has been occurring under the direction of scientists of the United States Forest Service. Soon after landing, Dick Denny and Peter Mickelson were in a boat heading for a rendezvous with the men who were rounding up and banding the geese in the area where the molting birds were congregated. This Copper River Delta area is one of North America's most important goose breeding areas. This time each year, the geese undergo their annual molt and become flightless. So boats such as this can approach the birds on the water and herd them easily. Soon the new flight feathers of the geese will develop and they'll be able to fly again. When the geese become flightless as a result of the molt, they swim together in huge rafts of birds, such as this one. Often, there are many of these rafts in the area. The inability to fly makes them easy to herd. And right now, the boats being operated by the personnel of the U.S. Forest Service are driving these birds toward a pre-selected area on shore where they can be herded into an extensive holding pen and then banded. This whole operation is under the direction of Peter Mickelson. Our research here determines if families of geese stay together for extended periods. Information is gathered, too, about nest site selection by the geese.
The studies point out the degree of use by the geese of their habitat here and tell us what changes may have occurred since the 1964 earthquake. This is the area now where the birds will be driven ashore. As they are driven ever further up onto the shore by the men, the walking geese will encounter a fence which will guide them toward the principal holding enclosure. This subspecies is unique in that it breeds only here and winters only in Oregon's Willamette Valley. Because of these isolation habits, it is much easier to study than other goose species. Now that we've come ashore, today's banding work will begin. We'll follow the geese up toward the holding pen and make sure none of the birds begin to balk and try to get back to the water. They are now moving well along the fence, which will funnel them into the enclosure. portion of our research deals with the attachment which forms between males and females and the fidelity which develops between mates. The last of the geese are entering the pen. Now we can close off the entry gap and begin today's banding and collaring operation. Although many adult geese and some of the yearlings will be banded today, we won't be attaching either collars or bands on this year's crop of goslings. Those birds, if they survive the winter, will probably be banded next summer when they return here. Now that the geese are well confined, we are joined by some youngsters of the Youth Conservation Corps who were working with the geese elsewhere on the Delta. They've come here to assist us. The Youth Conservation Corps was established by Congress in 1970 within the Departments of Interior and Agriculture. In essence, it's young people working on a variety of conservation projects which are vitally needed and which provide lasting benefit for the environment through the conservation of natural resources. Ben Ames is a forest service biologist. He's a YCC temporary leader, and from him and others helping here, the youngsters not only learn conservation practices, but increased respect for wildlife. The youngsters benefit because they're challenged with meaningful problems and situations that help them acquire increased self-dignity from accomplishing something important. Right now, as some of them drive geese into little pockets of the fence where they can more easily be caught by hand, Others of the YCC youngsters are preparing the bands and collars. They've learned how to handle and carry the birds without hurting them and without getting them overexcited yet without a lot of wasted movements. As soon as a fence pocket can be emptied of its geese, the young workers left in the enclosure will set about driving more into it.
Each of the birds being handled today will have both leg bands and neck collars attached. By far, the greater portion of this work will be done by the YCC workers, who quickly become skilled at their tasks. The leg bands are primarily for hunter recovery, to determine what percentage of the population is harvested in a given season. Return of the bands these youngsters attach also provides data on the distribution and migrational patterns of the species. Much other information is acquired in this program by the long distance observation of the geese through binoculars when they're wearing the color and number coded collars. Collar sightings identify individual birds and answer many questions about the life cycle of the dusky Canada goose. Dick Denny wanted to witness the research project in action and to contribute to it if possible. So he traveled from Alaska to the William L. Finley National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon to observe the arrival of the dusky Canada geese from Alaska. This refuge is one of several in the Willamette Valley and that valley is the only wintering ground of the dusky Canada geese. The early winter dawns here are cold and misty, a situation the geese seem to like. Although it has brightened some, heavy mist still hangs low as Dick Rogers, manager of this refuge, gives directions where the blind has been set up that Dick can use while observing the geese that are arriving here in their migration. As often occurs, the mist has begun to clear rapidly and I'm arriving none too soon at the blind. Fortunately, there have been no alarm cries from the geese, which indicates that I've been able to get inside the blind without having been seen. Out in the more open area of the marsh, there are still some places where the morning mist hangs low. Already I've sighted a Copper River bird with a red neck collar, and that's encouraging. The number on the collar will provide information on the sex, range, and migrational habits of the bird. Now two collared birds are visible. There's another. Already a fair number appear to have made the flight safely. Even while I'm watching, some new arrivals show up and they include at least a couple with collars. The data gathered in this banding and collaring program is highly important because the dusky Canada goose is a unique subspecies found nowhere else in the world. Because the geographic range of the entire subspecies is very limited, it permits researchers to make detailed studies at a minimum of cost and effort. Data obtained is clearer and easier to interpret than that from species having the many variables created by wide geographical nesting and winter distribution. Although to the uninformed, this subspecies appears to be identical to the more familiar and common Canada goose. There are some important differences. They are darker in coloration and weigh considerably less. Since this particular subspecies is limited to the Copper River Delta to the north and the Willamette Valley here in Oregon, it is susceptible to having its numbers quickly diminished, and so close management is important.
the dusky Canada geese arrive here in the Willamette Valley in October and stay for the winter, migrating northward to Alaska again in April. With a continuation of good game management procedures, such stirring sights and sounds as these will continue to occur. The efforts of scientists of the U.S. Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife Service are allowing great flocks of waterfowl to continue to pleasantly fill our skies. And since the studies in Alaska indicated that natural predators are no great concern, it appears that the dusky Canada geese will always be nesting in safety in the marshes of the land at River's End. The continuing research being conducted by the United States Forest Service at Alaska's Copper River Delta is far from finished. Therefore, its full value in regard to the possible effect predators are having on nesting geese will only become known with the passage of time. However, projects such as this one are the key to possibly preserving some of our endangered species. By expanding our knowledge of what wildlife needs in order to survive, we become more able to establish conditions which promote survival. Through such conservation programs, man can eliminate or reduce potential threats to the survival of many species in the wild kingdom.